Hi guys, uh, I'm coming in for today's video, although it's a little late, I understand that, and so I do apologize in the forefront. Um, today marks 172 years since the end of the Mexican-American War, was, uh, which was basically ended with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, and, and which was ratified by the U.S. Senate on March 10th of that year. Now, although I could just go over the end of the war very easily, it wouldn't really make much sense to do so because you wouldn't really know much about the war in its own right. So today's video will focus on the Mexican-American War, which is a very little-known conflict that occurred between the United States and Mexico during the 1840s. Now to really go at the roots of this, we're actually going to go even further back, and we're going to hit to the 1820s over Texas. And basically, in the 1820s, Mexico became a nation that was independent from Spain. I, if I remember correctly in my mind here, it gained independence in 1821, although I might be wrong on that date, but it was around then. Mexico kind of needed money for its economy, and it had a vast amount of territory. That It got most of what had formerly been New Spain and the Americas it stretched up to the regions of California and Texas and all that. Well, Mexico, in the one part of its northern territory, which was known as Tejas, which is Texas, it was very sparsely populated, and there was a lot of Indian raids in this area. The Indians were constantly raiding and pillaging, thinking that they could reclaim this land for themselves. Now, the Mexican government really couldn't, it wasn't really that powerful on the military end at all, and it really started thinking, well, how can we better protect this northern province from an Indian takeover? And the answer they came up with was, Let's bring, let's at least invite the Americans to settle here in Tejas. Well, unfortunately, that was where it was going to go wrong. Now, when the Mexicans offered this offer, they offered free land to any American settler that would come to Tejas and settle on the condition that they convert to Catholicism, that they basically pay Mexican taxes, speak Mexican, they must speak, well, not Mexican. They must speak Spanish. Uh, my apologies. They would have to speak Spanish, convert to Catholicism, and they would have to not own slaves, which was forbidden under Mexican law. Where in the United States, especially in the South, it was legal. Now, of course, many Americans actually took this up, but unfortunately for Mexico, a lot of the Americans really didn't keep their word on this when they settled in Tejas. Which, from now on, I think we're just going to call Texas, but I will mention it by that name when it happened. <laughs> well, anyway, most Americans that were coming to Texas were cotton farmers. And in the U.S., cotton farming plantations were all throughout the South, and they required a large number of people to work them, which in the South typically turned into the form of African American slaves. Now, very unfortunately, the settlers kind of oh, disobeyed. All the Mexican provisions of this, I mean, they got the free land, the Mexicans kept their part of the deal, but the American settlers did not, due to the factor that when these settlers would come to Texas, they commonly would often, A, many of them secretly remain Protestant, they would not truly convert to Catholicism, many of them did not even bother learning how to speak Spanish, they continued to speak English, and ultimately, uh, many, many of them, just against Mexican law, brought in slaves. To help, my, to help really work these cotton fields that they started fitting, setting up in the Texan farmland. And this continued constantly throughout the 1820s. Well, by 1829, Mexico kind of realized we might have a problem here because not only were these citizens disobeying, but by that time there had been an increasing number. Remember that Texas had already been sparsely populated. There wasn't that many ethnic Mexican people that were in Texas. By 1829, there were 20,000 American settlers that were now settled in Texas alone that were living here, and it really started to outnumber the native Mexican population. So the Texans kind of, not only that, but they were openly disobeying Mexican law. Well, that year, Mexican President um, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana was basically the president of Mexico at this time, and he ripped up the 1826 Mexican Constitution. 
that had allowed for a lot of these things to take place. And then he wrote a new one that really curbed the immigration of new American settlers into Texas. Now, Texans really continued to do this illegally anyway, and eventually Santa Ana pro proposed and passed new laws that even further inhibited on this. It got the Texans to the point that they decided, we're going to revolt, we're rebelling, we've had enough of this. You want to infringe on our rights, you can we're taking Texas for our own. Now, mind you, that Texas was already, was already fearing they did not want Texas to become independent because they feared if Texas were to become independent, they could lose it to the United States, as it would probably be annexed by the country. So, of course, Mexico was very opposed to this. And in 1836, this rebellion became openly violent when, in February of that year, the Texans, a small Texan rebel army, took over and occupied a Spanish mission. Uh, the the Spanish mission of the Alamo, and Santa Ana personally led a number of troops on a 13-day siege to the Alamo, and eventually broke. And when they got into the into the mission, they slaughtered almost everyone inside, save for a few women and their children. And many m many American settlers were killed in this, including frontiersman Davy Crockett. Well, very unfortunately, this ticked off the people of Texas immensely. They were no longer very happy with the Mexican government, and this was the, I mean, if it hadn't been the final straw before, this was now the final straw. They were now done with the Mexican government infringing on their apparent perceived rights. And shortly after, thereafter, the Texans rallied around the cry of, remember the Alamo, and Texans under the command of um, Sam Houston not only defeated the the Mex the Mexicans at a critical battle a few months later, but managed to capture Santa Ana. Wound ha had he was wounded, and they ended up capturing him and forced him to relinquish Me Mexican control and claimed to Texas there. And Texas was granted its independence by Mexico. Now, immediately after, now Texas was now known as the Republic of Texas, or also known as the Lone Star Republic for its flag that only had one star. And Texas immediately wanted to be annexed by the United States. They had really not any interest of being their own country for full time. Well, the same issue that had really sparked the issue with the Texan Revolution, slavery, ended up being an inhibitor to them joining the United States, as do as the United States at that time was going through a debate over the expansion of slavery, and half of the United States supported it, and half of it did not. And they feared that admitting Texas, well, of course, Texas had slaves, so Texas would be admitted as a slave state, and this would offset the balance of power in Congress between the North and the South. And unfortunately, this kind of put Texas in a sort of limbo state for the next almost, roughly, for the next eight or nine years. And eventually, in the election of 1844, a man named James K. Polk, basically, he came, he won the presidential election. Now, Polk had been a, basically, a student of sorts under the tutelage of his political mentor, who had been Andrew Jackson, who had been the seventh president of the United States. And he was so much like Jackson in the regard of his beliefs and his political views that where Jackson's nickname had been Old Hickory for his toughness, Polk was known as Young Hickory. Now, Polk heavily believed, and he campaigned on this quite evidently, that it was the United States' manifest destiny, which was a very common idea at the time, that it was America's destiny to, and rightful duty to expand westward, to ocean to ocean. And he heavily capitalized on this on the campaign, claiming that the first thing that they were going to do, they were going to annex Texas, and they were going to gain more territory and expand the United States' borders. Well, Polk won the election that, that year, and in March of 1845, within days of taking office, he annexed the Te Republic of Texas, and it was Texas became the 28th state. Now, this, of course, angered the Mexicans immensely, and in the about a week after... Polk had signed the order to annex Texas. Mexico severed all relations, diplomatic relations with the United States as they were basically pretty much ticked off at the U.S. And soon a new problem became evident because as Texas had been admitted to the United States, a border issue arose. 
Now, when Texas had basically broken away and become independent from Mexico, even then, although Santa Ana had, at the time, he was, he was no longer president by this point, Although he had basically at this time declared that Texas, that Mexico relinquished all claims to Texas, he kind of went, Mexico kind of went back on his word. And Mexico really just kind of, excuse me, Mexico went back on this word and they kind of still had claims to Texas claiming almost, as a breakaway province. Kind of like in, a, a viable example today would be, uh, China claiming that Taiwan is a renegade province, although in my opinion they're not. But that's another that's another whole another issue altogether. We won't really get into that. Maybe another day. But anyway, <laughs> uh, Mexico still had these claims to Texas, and on top of that, there was a dispute over Texas's southern border. Now, as of today, and today as we all know, the southern border of Texas with Mexico follows the Rio Grande River. Now, back then, this is what Texas claimed, and when the United States annexed Texas, they took up the Texas claim as well, so they claimed that Texas' boundary with Mexico was the Rio Grande. Well, unfortunately, Mexico claimed it was the Nueces River further north, which was about, I not quite 100 miles north, but I think it was close to that. But they claim this on the grounds that even when Texas or Tejas had been a part of Mexico, the border of this province had never been any farther south than the Nueces. Well, Mexico did not claim this, and the United States claimed the otherwise, and this really set off a dispute with, between the United States and Mexico over what the proper border should or was. Now, do a pardon me, at times I'm going to have to look at my notes here. I had to write the stuff down, that way I would not exactly forget it, because trying to remember all, all this out of my head in one instant, it would bound to forget something. I didn't want to leave anything out. So if I look like I'm looking off the screen here, I'm actually looking at my notes, which I can actually... These are actually notes, I don't know if you can really read them that well, but these were the notes I've taken. So I'm just flipping that to remind my, and refresh my brain. But anyway... In September of 1845, uh, President Polk, basically, he sent a uh, uh, diplomat, do pardon, <laughs> he sent a diplomat by the name of, um, hold on, let me look here, uh, by the name of John Slidell to Mexico City, which was, of course, as it is today, it is the capital of Mexico, he sent this diplomat, John Slidell, to Mexico City, and Slidell's purpose was to negotiate a deal with the Mexican government and to have an audience with the Mexican president of Jose Herrera. Now, Slidell was basically sent to negotiate a agreement to the Texas border. He was sent to also kind of negotiate and settle U.S. claim U.S. claims against Texas, and as an another offer, under Polk's view. He had also agreed that he was going to try to purchase the Mexican provinces of California and New Mexico, which to the Mexicans was known as Alta California and Nuevo Mexico. And he was going willing to purchase those lands for up to $30 million. Now, President Herrera kind of caught wind of what Slidell's true intentions were when he was going on his way to meet him, and he actually denied Slidell this meeting and turned him back. And Slidell, Slidell then returned to the United States and told Polk of this, and basically Polk was infuriated. Now, the Mexicans were just as infuriated because of the fact that they were not interested in selling California or New Mexico, and they kind of viewed that if we agreed to the border of the U.S. once with Texas, or if we agreed to selling New Mexico and California, it was kind of a stain to Mexican national honor. So they were not really willing to do so. Well, Polk, he was so determined to have this territory that he was willing to go by any means necessary. He would not take no for an answer. And eventually Polk came to a decision that in January of 1846, he ordered General Zachary Taylor to take a battalion of U.S. troops to the, to the disputed area between the Nueces and the Rio Grande River to occupy it. 
But Polk knew this would probably provoke the Mexicans. He knew this. Well, it was no surprise when on April 25th of that, in the next couple of months, on April 25th, Mexican cavalry had marched across the Rio Grande and they attacked these troops and they ended up, I think, if they ended up killing 12 of these U.S. soldiers and capturing 52. These Mexican cavalry units then went further along and attacked a U.S. fort that had been set up on the Rio Grande. This, although the area had been disputed, Polk kind of used this as an excuse to declare war on Mexico, claiming that U.S. blood had been sh that American blood had been shed on American soil. Now, this was highly disputed in Congress at the time due to the fact that the territory that it had happened on was still disputed, and there were many that kind of opposed this, including one of the most adamant um, rejections of this was actually from Republican Congressman Abraham Lincoln, who would become the 16th president roughly a couple, about 10 years later. Well, a little more. But anyway, Lincoln, who was serving as a representative in the House of Representatives for Illinois at that for Illinois at that time, basically had stated that it was inconceivable to really know for certain whether it had truly been sh the blood had been shed truly on American soil or not. There were arguments that Polk had really just used this to, to his advantage. But in any event, Polk on May 11th asked for Congress to declare war on Mexico, issuing that a war state of war existed between the two nations. And on May 13th, Congress did pass a declaration of war. And Mexico had then around that same time issued its statement that it was going to intend to fight a defensive war against U.S. Uh, against American enroachment on its territory. So now both nations had officially really declared war on each other. Now, the United States had really developed two key plans, well, two two-pronged attack when they brought up plans for this war. And one was one army was going to move west and take the Mexican provinces of New Mexico and California, and another would move south into the heartland of Mexico itself. Well, General Zachary Taylor, who had had the incident near the Rio Grande back in April, was selected to lead the army south, and for the army, and the army of the west was formed in Missouri that with Colonel Stephen Kearney as its leader. And another smaller army was then formed in Missouri that saying that would accompany Kearney, and that was under the command of Colonel John C. Fremont. Well, Kearney was the first one to really move, and within it, he took his troops out. If let me let me look here a second. Um, basically, Kearney had, if I look here at my notes, Kearney had moved out in just a couple weeks after the declaration of war. So this is late May, early June. And by basically December, he had bas already moved so fast through the territory that he had taken it. He had taken Santa Fe and Albuquerque in New Mexico and then moved for the Sonoran Desert in Arizona. Basically, he took New Mexico without problem. It, there was very little Mexican resistance there, and most of the people that lived there were actually very jubilant for American occupation. They weren't exactly opposed to it. So there really wasn't no hardship in taking those territories. Well, in January, Kearney and Fremont both finally crossed all the way across the West because Fremont had gone a little farther north and they entered California. And when they entered California, by this time, the Americans had sent a naval fleet under the command of Commodore Ugh. Matthew Perry had been sent through the Cape Horn down and around South America, and they came up the Pacific coast, and they blockaded Mexico's Pacific coast, which at this time included California's. And basically, they moved very swiftly from California starting in January of 1847, and within just a couple months, they had crushed most of the resistance, and, uh, well, not even months, it was just actually days. And on January 10th, the Americans occupied Los Angeles after having laid siege to the city, and this basically ended the fighting in California. Now, mind you, they had help along the way because before they had actually gotten there, the local Californians had learned of the U.S. declaration of war, and they had actually declared a similar 
uh, rebellion as Texas had done years before and declared that they were the Bear Flag Republic, which was now set up. But of course, they were annexed by the United States by choice. So they would eventually become Cal the state of California. And that basically, the war, that area was pretty quick. And at the time, most of the settlements were in New Mexico. Arizona was really undeveloped at that time, but it was more wilderness. It wasn't until after the Civil War that anything really started getting formed in Arizona. But it, mostly the big captures were the states, what would become the states of New Mexico, Arizona, California, and Nevada and Utah. Well, at the same time, Kearney had set out from uh, Missouri, General Zachary Taylor had started to move south with his army into Mexico. Now, at this very same time, keep in mind that when the war started, President Jose Herrera had been the president of Mexico. Now, he was ousted just two months after the war really broke out, and there was at least six successive presidents in, of Mexico that kind of came about. They had constantly coup d'etats and everything else that were happening. Excuse me. Well, eventually, um, General Antonio de Lopez de Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. He was the former president of Mexico. He was exiled in Cuba at the time. He had went there after losing the Texas Revolution in 1836. He had kind of convinced Polk, President Polk, to send him back to Mexico through the U.S. naval blockade, and he would try to negotiate an end to the war on terms that were favorable to Mexico. Well, anyway, now, he had convinced Polk that he was going to go back and try to work for peace and that it would be favorable to the U.S. Now, Polk actually bought into this, and he chartered a boat to send um, Santa Ana back. Well, as soon as he got to Mexico, Santa Ana actually went back on his word, betrayed the U.S., basically, and he took charge of the Mexican armies. And not only that, he also declared himself as president again, of which the Mexican people, although they had not really liked Santa Ana before because he kind of was a dictator almost, like a military dictator, they did admit that he, when it came to the defense of Mexico, he was probably the best man for the job. Well, Zachary Taylor then moved, started moving his troops down south through Mexico. They had a couple of skirmishes along the Rio Grande, but they really just crushed anything that the Mexicans could offer, really, in resistance in that area. And they then crossed the Rio Grande into actual the heartland of Mexico. Well, and basically, this was in 1846 still. Basically, they had... Give me a second here. By the time this had happened, but... By roughly, yeah, I'm, as I'm looking right here, about the same time that the Battle of La Mesa was happening in California that would gain, basically, Los Angeles for the United States to take, um, Taylor was moving south, and he took the Mexican city of Monterey. And then, subsequently, in the couple days after, and this was in February of 1847, this was shortly after the campaign in the North had really concluded, Taylor also had defeated one of the large major Mexican forces at the Battle of Buena Vista. And unfortunately, this basically secured Texas for the United States and the rest of the other provinces. But Polk wanted them to go into Mexico itself. Now, Taylor kind of didn't really show much enthusiasm for a full-scale invasion of Mexico. And in fact, uh, multiple times when he had fought these battles... He really let some of the Mexicans just kind of go off without pursuing them. And this kind of infuriated President Polk. So President Polk, instead of dismissing Taylor because he had become hugely and immensely popular by this time, he ordered General Winfield Scott to take a army by sea, an amphibious invasion, and they were to take the Mexican seaport of Veracruz in the Gulf of Mexico. And then after taking the port, they were to head West, inward to west into Mexico and take Mexico City, the Mexican capital. Well, and this did happen. And if I'm looking here, this uh, Winfield Scott and his army made their move in March. They landed on at the Mexican seaport of Veracruz on March 9th of 1847, and they. That this was really the first major amphibious landing operation that, that was ever done by the United States. And they took the city after a roughly, I think, 13-day siege. They 
I mean, you can do the math in your head, I suppose. I've never really been good with that. But the siege ended on March 29th, and the Americans took Veracruz. And it was a very straight line from there, and that happened in March, that they marched rapidly to the west. And in September, on September 14th of 1847, they successfully captured Mexico City, taking the Mexican capital. And basically, the Mexican government had fallen apart by that time, and Mexico had surrendered it's basically any military resistance was now done. The military phase was now over. The war was pretty much done. Well, immediately following the capture of Mexico City, President Polk sent the U.S. diplomat. He had actually sent him with Winfield Scott to negotiate a peace. He was by, going by the name of Nicholas Trist, was to negotiate a peace. Well, unfortunately for Polk, the peace kind of had to be delayed a little bit because Mexico's government had collapsed. It kind of had to form a new one because Santa Ana, who had declared himself president again, had fled again into exile, and this time he fled to Jamaica. So a new Mexican government had to even be formed that could even discuss talking about making a peace. Well, just before, as finally, it, this took so long, though, to happen as they were negotiating that Polk became so aggravated he almost recalled Trist, but just before he could do so, Trist had actually come up with a treaty with the Mexicans in February of 1848, and that was known as the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and we March 10th I relate to it, because although Mexico signed it in February, and we did as well, it was not officially ratified until March 10th of 1848. And in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexico gave up one-third of its territory. It gave up the disputed border with Texas to the United States. It gave up New Mexico and California to it as well in exchange for basically the end of the war. Now, the Americans did not occupy Mexico as a sovereignty. They very well could have, but they chose not to, and they left Mexico alone, really, on that part. But as the U.S. terms of that treaty, Mexico gave up all that territory, but in exchange... The United States paid Mexico uh, roughly about uh, $15 million, which, keep in mind, it was only half of what they had been offered previously before the war for the territory. And the U.S. government offered to take $93 million worth of um, American settlers' claims against Mexico into their own hands, that the, gov the U.S. government would take care of it. Not Mexico didn't have to worry about $93 million worth of it, which really kind of helped Mexico out, but it also put it – Mexico was still heavily in debt at that time. So it really didn't help that much, and losing the war really didn't help their national honor. Well, the Guadal Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo officially ended the Mexican War and gained most of what would become the states of Texas, Nevada, Utah, California, Arizona, and New Mexico. In 1853, a few years later down the road, a small portion of Arizona and New Mexico would also be purchased in the Gadsden Purchase that would finally complete that, which would complete basically the border of the American Southwest. Now, after the war, the United States was jubilant. It was happy. We'd won the war. It was a splendid little war. We got a bunch of territory from it. People were eager. They were happy that we could really expand westward like we thought we were meant to be. But then the ugly problem began to rear its, rear its head again, and that was the issue of slavery. And this time, unlike in 1820 with the Missouri Compromise, very unfortunately, this time when it happened, it was not going to go away, and when it eventually did, civil war was going to break out, which was kind of very weird, given the fact because of the factor that Mexico had fought so hard and long to become independent from Mexico, wanted to become a next by the U.S., became a 28th state, had U.S. even fought a war to make it that status, and then within not even 20 years, they actually seceded from the United States. In the Civil War, it had to be readmitted later on after joining the Confederacy in the Civil War. But basically, the Mexican-American War, and also as I'm going on here, the U.S. did not really suffer a whole lot of casualties from death on the battlefield in this war. There were roughly 1,500 people, soldiers, that died from being killed or wounded in action. Well, there were 10,000 that were killed from illness, such as yellow fever, measles, smallpox, stuff like that. It was a large thing. 
after the war in the United States really it intensified the slavery issue eventually to the point the Civil War really came because the problem came with now these new territories were well beyond that line of the Missouri Compromise when much slavery was now free to expand into new territory. And Mexico was really set off in economic status. It couldn't. It was down in debt and it had an animosity toward the U.S. that wasn't really apparent until the later part of the 19th century. But in any case, now the Mexican-American War Although it was only two years long, it was vitally important because it gained basically what became the American Southwest and the American West for the United States. It dramatically expanded the nation's borders and really also intensified the debate over slavery to the point that this time it was not going to go away and was going to have to be solved once and for all. So in a way, it kind of was the precognator to the Civil War and actually to even further relate it to the Civil War. Um, Many of the generals who fought in the Civil War had gained first gained their first battlefield experience in this war. Union generals such or the North, what would become, what was basically the United States. Do pardon. Um, though many of those generals would gain experience, such as Ulysses S. Grant, George Gordon Meade, um, William Sherman. Joseph Hooker, they all gained, those were northern generals that had fought in the Mexican-American War. And then on the south, you also had the likes of Robert E. Lee, um, Thomas Jackson, or Stonewall Jackson, as he was also known, George Pickett, and PGT Beauregard had all fought in the Mexican-American War. All these generals who had become so prominent in the Civil War really got their first taste of war in the Mexican-American War as soldiers. They had not been commanders at the time, they were simply soldiers at the time. And after the war, it really also started another political career because of the factor that General Zachary Taylor, in the election of 1848, because Polk had agreed when he ran, he was only going to run for one term, and then he was going to give up the presidency, and he did so. And in fact, he died three months after leaving office in 1849, so he actually had the shortest retirement of any president. But General Zachary Taylor got nominated to be president, and he actually won the election in 1848, and he became the 12th president in 1849, although he died in office in 1850 due to food poisoning. <coughs> do, do, excuse me. But anyway, the Mexican-American War, really, it set the prelude for the Civil War, finally, but it also gained the United States a huge amount of territory in its grip that, without, the United States would not be who it is today. Now, and also, just what we all know, relations between the United States and Mexico, although they can seem bad at times, they are immense, a lot greater than they are than they were back then. Back then, they were never really that great. So, the Mexican-American War, very interesting little chapter in history that most people don't exactly know about, but it was very worth mentioning due to what today anniversary was with that respect to that war. Now, on Friday, I'm still debating over what topic I want to do, but at this point, I'm possibly looking into doing something on the impeachment of Andrew ja Johnson. I almost said Jackson there for a second. Uh, Andrew Johnson, who was the president right after Abraham Lincoln, he was the first president to be impeached. So it was really a historic trial, and Johnson had actually almost been removed. He was saved removal by one vote. So I may talk about that on Friday, or I may come up with a different topic, but I will definitely see what I can do on that. Any, and any other regards here, um, basically, I will continue to put out videos when I can here. Um, please be sure to like or subscribe in the comments below if this video was any bit helpful. I will post some links to some videos that were instrumental or at least helpful in the information that they could give. And I will post these either in this video or on the main channel. I will provide the links to them. That way you can take a look at them for yourselves. So I hope this video might have helped clarify or at least get you some general knowledge and stuff. Because, in fact, from my personal experience, from people that I've asked, most people don't even know that the United States and Mexico have ever actually gone to war at any point in their history. So it was kind of a shock to me as well when I first learned of it years ago. So I thought that I might as well to speak about the entire war because no one else is really going to know that they've gone to war in the past. And I mentioned the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and you know, that they went to war and you'd probably be thinking, wait, they went to war? When? I didn't know that. Probably because, truth be told, 
And I hope there's no history teachers watching this. Some history teachers failed to do their job entirely, which I hope gets corrected in the near future. <laughs> but anyway, that was basically the gist of that. Um, that's basically all I have for this this session. So I hope to see you all next time. Again, be sure to like or subscribe in the comments below if this was helpful. And also be sure to let me know any topics of personal choice that you have any interest in, and I will gladly do them even if i had one plan i'll make an i'll substitute that for the day because i would love to have com at least comments that suggest a topic that is of interest to other people to learn about other than just ones that i come up with it would be a great help so if that's possible do be sure to do that so anyways uh have a good night uh, i hope to see you all in the next video that will be hopefully coming out here in a few days so have a good night and stay well